Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those just voyaging into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. Hope you all had a nice Thanksgiving. The holiday season is officially upon us. Along with that, as a society, we are obsessed with games. We love to watch them and cheer for our favorite teams. We love to play with our friends, but sometimes, sometimes, the fear of losing will make you so desperate you will do whatever it takes to win, even if it means risking your own life and taking down everyone else around you in your fatal games. First, a small box of death followed by a killer game of truth or dare. Then, a mother's living nightmare. Finally, in our featured story, a fatal game of Bloody Mary. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week, and of those, the scariest ones make it into our podcast, along with the story that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com slash snarled. If you have a tale you're dying to share, Send me an email at something scary at snarl.com. So, want to hear something scary? Fatal Games. When the promise of money clouds your judgment, all the remorse in the world won't bring back the dead. Like in this story inspired by Donna. Megan was exhausted after a long day of work. She sat slumped on the couch watching the evening news. The lead story was about a man who had been found dead in his house in seemingly mysterious circumstances. There was no sign of trauma, no physical wounds on his body. Entry to the home had not been forced. The reporter explained that the cause of death was a complete failure of his central nervous system, similar to what happens with an intense fear reaction. The only thing that seemed out of place was the huge stack of cash in the man's jacket pocket when he was discovered. The story held Megan's interest, as there had been something similar in the papers just a day or two ago. She was about to tell her wife, Keandra, about the bizarre similarity when she heard a knock at the door. It was almost 7 p.m., They weren't expecting anyone, and Keandra was upstairs getting their daughter ready for bed. When Megan opened the front door, she saw a tall man dressed in a black suit and hat standing at their doorstep, holding a small box in his gloved hands. Who was this strange man? Was he trying to sell something? The man quickly placed the box in her startled hands, As he intensely looked at Megan, one of his eyes was green, the other was blue. Listen carefully. I will not repeat myself, the stranger instructed in a smooth voice. This box is very special. If you were to open it, you would find a lever with two labels, pay and return. He tapped the top of the box with a finger. I will leave it with you for 24 hours. Within that time, you must make that choice. Pay or return. Megan glanced down at the small box. It looked okay, made of wood and painted white. If you choose return, I will reclaim the box and you will never hear from me again. However, if you choose pay, a person unknown will die. Megan gasped, but the man showed no emotion as he added, But you will earn $10,000. He lowered his mismatched eyes, hiding them under the rim of his black fedora. That is all. Now I will leave you to make your choice. He turned on his heel and melted into the darkness of the night. Megan was baffled, but took the box inside. She walked into the kitchen where Keandra was warming some milk. She explained the strange encounter. 
Keandra examined the box. It was completely normal, made of plywood, white inside and out with a little black metal lever. Two small brass plaques read, pay and return, as the man had indicated. Keandra questioned if it was even real or just a prank, as they debated their choices. They didn't want someone to die, but $10,000 would help with school and medical bills. They could really use the money, and for all they knew, the unknown person in question could be sick already. They made their choice, held hands, and pressed the lever towards the little plaque that read, Pay. The next day, when Keandra was finishing up homework with their daughter, Megan was pacing around the den when, just before 7 p.m., there was a knock at the door. She rushed to open it and found the same man in black attire with the chilling green and blue eyes. I see you chose pay, he said nonchalantly. Here is your payment, as promised. He pulled a large stack of money out of his pocket and placed it in Megan's hands. Now, the box, please. Megan returned the strange item and the man left without another word. She shut the door and walked into the den, money in hand. Part of her was in shock that it had actually happened. And she was also feeling anxious as she turned up the volume on the TV. Right on cue, the newscaster began to report about another mysterious death. A healthy young lady, Alexandra Cliffside, had died unexpectedly in her house with no physical injuries and no signs of forced entry to her house. It seemed like yesterday's victim, she had died from fright. Yet again, the only evidence of any interest was a money clip loaded with $100 bills in her bedside drawer. The total was calculated as exactly $10,000. A lot of cash for a kindergarten teacher. Her daughter's kindergarten teacher. Megan's hand flew to her mouth to stifle a scream. She looked at the wad of banknotes still in her other trembling hand. They'd let their desire for money get in the way of a human life. Unknown had meant they couldn't choose. Not that they wouldn't know the person who'd been chosen. The much loved teacher who just happened to be in possession of exactly $10,000. Megan suddenly understood with terrifying clarity what pay meant. There had been an undisclosed caveat. She was now intrinsically part of the game. The next person to choose pay would set the ball rolling. An unknown pool of victims who had also chosen pay before her. And now Megan was part of that deadly lottery. Nothing in life is free. Thank you so much, Donna, for inspiring this gambling horror for us. How about you, listener? Would you choose pay or return? Have you ever made a decision you deeply regretted but couldn't change? Would you make a deal with the devil to get what you want? The holidays are supposed to be happy times, but we know that as hard as we try, sometimes it doesn't work out that way. While there is certainly lots of fun to be had, families and friends can cause lots of stress and anxiety. If you just get the blues around the holidays, then schedule an appointment today to connect with a therapist at Talkspace. Therapy has made a huge difference in my life, and I believe it will make a big difference in yours as well. It's really easy to match with a licensed therapist and schedule a session. And you can also get unlimited messages with your dedicated therapist. If you need a little support to help you through the end of the year or want to start building towards a better upcoming year, Talkspace is here to help. Match with a licensed therapist when you go to Talkspace.com 
and get $100 off your first month with the promo code something scary. That's $100 off when you use code something scary at talkspace.com. It is often the people we assume are the toughest who crumble first in the face of real danger. Like in this story inspired by Rauhit. Bala was unpacking his suitcase, ready for his stay and training at the Sri Lankan Military Academy. He'd been allotted Barracks 9, along with three other cadets, Subu, Ravi, and Vavan. The mornings were usually spent with physical tasks and tactical maneuvers, and the nights were full of tired snores and aching grunts. After a month, Bala had gotten used to the routine and started looking for ways to enjoy the spare time in the evenings. He usually played cards with his buddies in the barracks, never noticing that the nights in the camp were eerily quiet. Everyone was too scared to leave the barracks after dark, fearful of patrolling guards, so they'd say. But one evening, during a wild game of truth or dare, Bala and Subu were dared by Ravi to fill their bottles from the water supply at the very back of the camp. Bala was reluctant, but Subu quickly agreed. He didn't want them to look like cowards. They tiptoed out quietly. This kind of act could get them in serious trouble, but Subu was adamant. They walked slowly towards the open field in front of their barracks. They didn't hear Vavon, still in the bunk, whispering. That wasn't very fair of you, Ravi. You didn't even warn them. To their surprise, they didn't see any guards or officers as they dashed to the water supply across the field. With Subu ahead, Bala thought he saw movement out the corner of his eye, but ignored it. They paused for just a moment on the pitch black field. We can still go back, Bala panted. If you want to, you can, but I am completing the stair with or without you, Subu exclaimed as he began to race off again. Bala realized he was too scared of being reprimanded and hurried back to the barracks where, to his dismay, A guard was already waiting. He caught a hold of Bala and shouted at him. Where have you been? Where is your friend? Bala was trembling as he whimpered. The far corner water supply. The guard's expression changed from anger to fear as he let go of Bala and sped off. Bala entered the barracks, not sure of what had just happened. His fellow cadets stood around, looking forlorn. We're sorry, said Favon with remorse. We didn't think you'd go. That water outlet, it, it's out of bounds at night for a reason. It's dangerous. What do you mean? Bala asked, thinking of Lyme disease and leeches. Ravi looked uncomfortable as he explained, and it was nothing like Bala could have expected. The water supply was in front of an old burial ground that ran behind the camp. Apparently, the pipeline for the water ran right through the cemetery, and it was believed it acted as an outlet to the unrested spirits that roamed the grounds. The camp was protected by a holy white line that had been blessed, but the water supply was just outside the protective line, and if anyone reached it unprotected at night, then they would be at the mercy of whatever spirit came across them. Bala couldn't believe what they were saying. It had to be a prank. Suddenly, there was a banging on the door. Silence. Then Subu's voice calling, I'm back. Bala was filled with relief that his friend was safe. He moved to open the door, but was stopped by Ravi. Bala looked behind and saw terror etched upon his fellow cadet's faces. Ravi shook his head, begging him not to open it. 
The banging grew louder and louder. Open up, the voice demanded, sounding far less like Subu now. Then the banging stopped abruptly. They breathed a short-lived sigh of relief as mere seconds later, something far worse replaced it, a growl. They huddled together, whimpering, but the noise started moving. Growls from the left, then the rear wall, finally from outside the open window. With a sudden movement, something jumped inside the barracks. The cadets screamed in unison. Whatever this thing was now, it was no longer their bunkmate, Subu. He'd been transformed. Now, with skeletal limbs dragging its feet unnaturally behind, it was covered in torn clothes like rags. With torn skin and bloodied hands, strands of straggling hair partially covered its face. Peering intensely from that hair were bright, red eyes. Bala bolted for the door, rushing out to find several officers standing in front of the barracks. He ran over to them, crying wildly. There's a monster inside. The officers surrounded him, blocking his path. He looked up in confusion and then dread. There was that same look of hollowness in their eyes. Their red eyes. Bala turned around to see more red-eyed officers approaching him and even more cadets following behind. Subu had unwittingly crossed the white line, breaking the protection for the entire camp. Once he'd stepped over the sacred marking, he'd allowed his body to become a vessel and opened the veil. Decades of wraiths and lost souls had been freed. And those souls and wraiths were hungry for the human experience. With so many vessels at hand, they were possessing them all. Sobbing, Bala fell to his knees. One simple game, one stupid dare had brought about utter devastation. The spirits who walk the earth trapped in their own personal purgatory had been able to enter the camp. The academy was infested with vengeful ghosts and no one was getting out as themselves are alive. Thank you so much, Rohit, for this military horror story. Have you ever been peer pressured into something you were scared to do? Was it worth it in the end? Have you ever witnessed anything supernatural that frightened you? I'm getting back into rings and this is a beautiful textured yet delicate ring that I love. Uh, I wish I'd gotten a couple more to put on different fingers because it's wonderfully stackable as well. It's like a little golden wreath of accomplishment. I feel almost royal whenever I look down at it. Uh, I got it at Ana Luisa. That's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A. Their jewelry is so affordable. I absolutely recommend checking out Ana Luisa. They release new collections every Friday. Shop.analuisa.com slash scary. And right now they're having a sale and you'll get 60% off. That's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A dot com slash scary. I enjoy the individual canvas pockets that Ana Luisa sends its jewelry in. The pockets are small and colorful enough to store with my other jewelry. Plus, when I start buying Ana Luisa for upcoming gifts for friends, I know what beautiful packaging I can expect for them. Go ahead and check out Ana Luisa for 60% off now. Shop.analuisa.com slash scary. Their beautiful pieces start at $39 and they're currently running the biggest sale of the year. You can get 60% off if you go on shop.analuisa.com slash scary. That's shop.analuisa.com slash scary. Hashtag Ana Luisa NY. A parent does what they can to make good decisions for their children. Sometimes those decisions are dead wrong. Like in this story inspired by Muhammad. Mama, 
I made a new friend. My five-year-old son, Doc, came rushing in from the yard, all smiles as I washed the dishes. I played along, since I really knew he had been playing alone outside in our yard. I asked him all about his new friend. His name is Laughing Laurie, and we are going to be best friends. As Doc ran to grab some more Legos, I wondered for a moment at the odd choice of Laughing Laurie as a name for an imaginary friend. But seeing how happy my son was, I let it go. That night, I had a terrible dream. I was at a carnival. Creepy music drifting through the air. I'd lost all my friends and was alone inside of the big top. The largest tent where all of the big shows occurred at any circus or carnival. All of a sudden, shadows of circus performers surrounded me. Then I realized in horror, they weren't performers. They were kids and they were all horribly mutilated and I woke up sweating. As I glanced at the alarm clock to check the time, I was surprised to see one of Doc's favorite stuffed animals on the pillow next to me. How had it gotten there? Honey, did you leave one of your toys in Mama's room? I asked the next morning, making waffles for breakfast. Doc shook his head. It wasn't him. Laughing Lori had put it there to watch me. Watch over me. That's sweet, I replied. No, Mama. To watch you. This pattern of behavior continued over the next couple of weeks. Being a single parent forced to work from home during COVID restrictions, Doc being entertained was a godsend. Even if things did keep going missing, especially from the kitchen... When I asked if he knew anything about it, Dak told me, Laughing Laurie is funny, but his jokes can be kind of mean. I was also suddenly suffering from occasional night terrors, and funnily enough, they were always about the circus. One afternoon, after a particularly bad night, I realized to my chagrin I had dozed off at my work table. Doc. I called out to him, but there was no answer. I ran into the yard. No sign of him. Racing to the front of the house, I saw him, sitting on the stoop, crunching something in his mouth. Dak, I called, running over to him. What are you doing out here, and what on earth are you eating? Candy, Mama. Dak replied as if I should have known from Laughing Laurie. Dak had never lied to me, yet I knew this couldn't be true. So I panicked, making him spit it out and empty his pockets. As we went back inside, I tried to get the truth out of him, but he was adamant the candy was from his imaginary friend. Later, as I stared at him, now playing on the floor with his toys, I could hear him humming. He was humming the song from my carnival nightmares. Things came to a head when I came down the next morning to discover every one of our tropical fish were dead. Floating in the tank with them were hundreds of the same candies Doc had been eating. Terrified that someone had been in the house, I called the cops and asked our neighbor Rhonda if she could look after Dak for a while. The police came, but found nothing untoward. Just a tank of dead fish. They collected the candy to check for poisons, but along with the fact that there was no culprit and no obvious sign of a break-in, my worries weren't high on their list of priorities. That night... I set up Dak's old baby monitor and slipped a kitchen knife under my pillow. Despite the police's reassurance, something had overloaded the tank with candy, and it wasn't me. Could Dak have done it, or was it something else? 
around 4 a.m., I was woken by the sound of static on the monitor, sounding like heavy breathing, moaning. Grabbing the knife, I raced into Dak's room and froze. My heart broke in two as I took in the devastation. My little boy was laid on the bed, ripped apart limb from limb. His gut had been torn open, organs discarded on the carpet below, and in their place were hundreds of little candies. I screamed in anguish, still unable to move. Then I heard a noise from beside me, coming from the closet. Frozen with fear and grief, I just about managed to turn my head. There, just outside the closet, was a figure, small yet oozing with menace. It moved awkwardly, and as it shuffled into the light, I thought I might pass out. It stood around four feet tall, dressed in black and white rags. On top of raggedy, greasy, straw-like hair sat a tiny pointed hat. Its face was stark, except for the white and red clown makeup around its eyes and mouth. A mouth stretched into a malicious grin, exposing yellowing, sharp teeth. It rocked back and forth as it moved, limbs dangling as it reached out towards me. Pop goes the weasel. It cackled in glee before breaking into a maniacal laugh. That broke my spell, and in a rage, I lunged forward and thrust the kitchen knife right into its chest and looked in utter horror as Dak's body now lay in my arms, his unbelieving eyes staring at the hilt of the knife in his chest. I looked wildly back over to his bed, but there... There was no mutilated body there. None. Just a single candy on his pillow. I looked down at my precious baby boy just before he uttered one last word. Mama. Thank you so much, Muhammad, for inspiring this circus-tented tale for us. If someone you knew had a friend you couldn't see, would you believe them? How would you be able to tell if that friend of theirs was a good spirit or a demonic one? Like lots of people, I've had my extra share of anxiety and stress. And as we all know, that can really cause moods to fluctuate, which isn't good for me or others around me. Noom's mood and stress program has me log my mood every day. It's helpful to see mood and stress trends through the week. That way I can try to eliminate or rearrange the things that bring on stress. It's been really helpful for me to make these changes. The Noom app is really easy to use and is backed by scientifically proven principles that teach you how to manage your stress and anxiety. A team of dedicated coaches are available 24 seven to support you. And there's a daily program that guides you all the way through. You are stronger than your stress. It doesn't get to control you. Equip yourself with the knowledge and skills to steer yourself to happiness. As experts in behavior change, Noom has helped millions of people through their weight loss program, so you know they can help you tackle stress too. All you need is 10 minutes a day, and it's an app, so it's there for you anytime, anywhere. Worry less and feel happier. Sign up for your trial at noom.com slash scary. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash scary to sign up for your trial. There is something about the idea of summoning spirits and communicating with the other side that gives us a thrill. But by the time we stop to think about what happens after we actually do that, the damage is already done. My friend Zamani and I were hanging out in my house one evening while my parents were at my brother's football game. We finished up a game of patchwork when she exclaimed, Lissy, we should play Bloody Mary. 
She was into all those creepy pastas and urban legends, but games like trying to call forth entities like Bloody Mary where you chant into a mirror scared me. Even the possibility of seeing Bloody Mary in the mirror or worse, being dragged inside of it was terrifying. But then she double dog dared me, so I had to accept. We headed towards the bathroom, her slippers slapping next to the squeak of my wheels against the hardwood floor. Stopping by the bathroom door, Zamani picked up the wooden cross on the wall next to a family portrait. You'll have to move that for now. There's no way Mary will come with that there. I took the cross from her and put it in the nearby linen closet. I slowly opened the bathroom door as if I expected Mary to be there, waiting for us, wielding her ax. My heart was already thumping. We entered, closing the door without turning on the light, so we were in total darkness. Facing the large mirror over the sink, we held hands and chanted, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, 12 times. We paused before the 13th, which would complete the incantation. I whispered, Do we really want to do this? I could sense Zamani's grin as she laughed and cried out, Bloody Mary! And nothing happened. We waited. Still, nothing. Relieved, I swiveled back for the light switch when Zamani grabbed me and whispered, Lissy, she's here. But there was nothing in the mirror, or at least it was too dark. I couldn't even see our reflections. I flipped on the light, looked back into the mirror, and gasped. Zamani didn't look like, well, Zamani. In her reflection, her eyes were black, soulless orbs, freckled skin now sickly-looking and flaky, and that smile, more like a grimace stretching across her face, almost reaching her ears. Gone were her jersey and cutoffs, replaced with an ill-fitting white dress. White, but stained with vast and ever-growing patches of red blood. I screamed in panic. The door wouldn't budge. I looked at the thing in horror, saw it whip its head to me. I began to sob, sure I would die of fright if it didn't get me first. And then... I bolted upright in my bed, as if ripped from a nightmare. It was nighttime. Had it all been just a dream? Despite my fear, I knew I had to check. As I headed to the hallway bathroom, I stopped by the linen closet, chilled to find the cross in there. I rehung it, angled inside, closed the bathroom door, and turned on the light. Psyching myself up, I turned around and stared into the mirror, only to see my so-called bad dream replay in the reflective surface. Zamani with black, soulless eyes, the maniacal grin stretching her face, the blood-stained clothing. I froze in terror, transfixed. Only this time at the end, my possessed friend stabbed me in the back, literally. I slumped forward, scrambling for purchase on the counter, expecting to see blood, feel pain. There was nothing, only shock. As I rubbed my eyes and the vision was gone. The mirror only reflected my own terrified face. Whimpering, I somehow made it back to my room and fell back into bed. Then I abruptly woke up again. Only this time it was morning. The smell of coffee and pancakes from the kitchen. My parents and brother getting ready for school. I rolled upright and gasped as a sharp pain in my back took my breath away. I pulled at my nightshirt, looking in the nearby mirror hung on my closet door. There, exactly where I'd been attacked in the dream, was a new inflamed reddened scar. If the wound was real, then that meant... 
the house line began to ring. My mom answered, then called out, Lissy, honey, did Zamani sleep over? Her mom is so on the phone and very worried. She didn't come home last night. This week's podcast stories were edited by Marquia McCarty, Janine Pipe, and Sarah Lukasiewicz. Narration by Marquia McCarty. Audio edited and mixed by Fitz Harris. Additional audio editing by Calvin Linderman. Art and graphics by Mari Carlson. Produced by Hannah Mullen and Marquia McCarty. Music by Sapphire Sandalo and Calvin Linderman. 